This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, Jonathan Gillard Daly, has labored in happy obscurity as a professional actor for over 40 years. His television and movie appearances have been confined to extra work, industrial film, and local arts and entertainment segments plugging regional theater productions from California to Florida and points in between. However, if you like to go to plays, you may well have seen John at work because he's acted in at least 28 states, many of them numerous times. John began his career working opposite the fine fellow hosting this very podcast. Well, that would be me. We appeared together as white-faced clowns battling over who gets to save the girl in a burning building in a children's theater production called Circus Magic at the University of Wisconsin. And then again, we were in a show patterned after Dr. Strangelove called Trust Me, which has been consigned to the dusty shelves of memory in which John and I played rival oligarchs. All of this happened more years ago than either of us will own up to. John Daly is an actor, really and truly. He's played King Lear, Atticus Finch, Otto Frank, Shylock, and Carl Sandburg, among dozens of other parts in regional theaters across America. He's also written four plays, all of which have been produced professionally. And he sings, too. Aside from being an actor and playwright, he's also a father of two and a husband of 37 years to his very patient wife, Gail. It's a great delight, truly a great delight and a real joy for me to welcome my longtime friend, the exceptionally talented John Daly, to StoryBeat today. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. I'm thrilled to be part of this. Well, I'm... I'm thrilled to have you be a part of it. So, so let's go back to your, your roots. Um, tell us a bit about your history. You've been at the acting game for quite a little while, but at what age uh, were you when the bug first hit you? I think the bug first hit me when I was doing one of my favorite things, which was to, uh, I would sit out in the backyard. This was like when I was about seven or eight years old. And I was a big, I've always been a big baseball fan. Right, and uh, I would take the transistor radio out into the backyard, and I would turn it on, and much to the delight of my mom, who apparently I found out later was watching a lot, uh, I would sit and act out the whole game. Oh wow! I would. Uh, I sometimes I'd be the batter, sometimes I'd be the pitcher, sometimes I'd be hanging out in the dugout, sometimes I'd be the announcer. <laughs> uh, I would I would play all these different roles. Uh, and act out the game literally as the as the game was going on. So right. the game would tell me what my script was, and I would uh, I would follow it. Wow! So for for many that do what you've been doing your your whole career, and by the way, I truly admire the fact that you have managed to have a a life and a career and raise a family as a journeyman actor. I think that's not all that common, and it's um, very impressive that you've done it. Um, for many, I think it's a calling. Is it so for you? Do you feel like acting is a calling? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's really not, you know, the way people, you know, when you, get to a, when you get to the point where you're becoming an adult and you have to figure out how you're going to make your way in the world, and you start thinking about, well, what kind of jobs could I do? What kind of, uh, you know, what, where should I interview uh, that just never occurred to me. I, I, I knew from before I even knew what what theater was. I knew that acting was this vocation. Um, you know, so it's it, it, it I it's never I've never had an alternative. 
It's, uh, it, I remember, gosh, when when we were in college together, uh, I had this discussion with my parents, and they were talking about, you know, the old fallback uh, conversation. Well, you know, you ought to have something to fall back on in case this <laughs> doesn't work out. Have you ever thought about having a fallback? And I would, you know, I'd pour and pour over, well, what could I do? I guess I, I suppose I could teach. I used to, that was another thing I used to do in the basement. I used to fantasize about being a, a teacher, and I would I would do lectures in, in the basement when I was a kid. So I thought, okay, I could do that. And I, I remember the day walking up Bascom Hill, or down Bascom Hill, to the education building right. uh, because I was going to register some, for some classes so that I could maybe be accredited to teach in case, you know, I needed it somewhere down the line. And I literally got to the door, and I had my hand on the door to walk in, and I said, no, no, this is a cop-out. This is a cop-out. I'm not going to do this because it's going to give me a reason to fail. That's so I refused. That, um, that that's good. Now, that, 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 there have been not uh, there have been a few times in my career when I have questioned the wisdom of that. You know, or when <laughs> you know things go, you have tough times in this business, and uh, sometimes I would double, kind of double check myself and say, "Geez, you know, this whole idea that I can't do anything else probably probably isn't really right, and maybe I should really think that through." Um, but ultimately, I've I've always gone back to no. It's not it's not what I can do. It's what I want to do. Sure. It's what I feel like I am destined to do, and that's being plays. Well, I you know that's clearly uh, worked out for you. I'm sure it doesn't work out for everybody, but it certainly has for you. And and uh, I have been I've been exceptionally lucky. You know, I I remember hitting those. You know. Uh, reading those stats from Actors' Equity, you know, that say, I, you know, I was, there was a point where I was in like the 97% percentile. Wow. You know, there were there were only 3% of all actors in America who were working more than I was. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just astonished at that, you know. But I, I, I think I, but I, I also kind of planned it that way. You know, I, I was really, a, and it was lucky because I was, I was really coming of age in kind of what now I would I think of as the golden age of regional theater, right? Where there were companies, there were there were artistic directors whose mission was to assemble an acting company uh, because this you know this director wanted to challenge actors to do as many different kinds of theater as possible. Uh, and that was always a big thing for me was just was being versatile. I wanted to be able to do everything. And that was a time when that kind of the regional theater movement was all about that was about was about nurturing actors uh, to do as many different things as they could. And that translates into long time commitments with theaters where they will where a theater will say, well, we want you for the whole year. We don't exactly know what you're going to do yet, but we're going to get you 36 weeks of employment. Uh, and I gravitated to places like that. Mm-hmm. So, so part of it was luck. A lot of it was luck, and, and a lot of it was planning it that way. Well, I, you know, you, naturally we all need a bit of luck in order to do what we do in this business. But right. uh, I don't want to downplay for a moment the fact that you're inordinately talented, John. And uh that that was always there. That well, was, you're very kind. Yes, well, uh, but I'm also truthful, and and it was very evident when we started, when we first met, and we're working together in Madison. That was, um, that was highly evident then. So it was no surprise to me that you've managed to do this. the The only surprise is is that uh, it's worked out because it's so hard to do what you've done. Um, yeah. Um, so all right. So when you begin to work on a role. Aside from reading the script, which is obvious, what is your approach? How do you come at a show? How do you develop a character? I think a lot of that stems from one of the first jobs I had professionally, uh, which was at a theater called uh, the Loretto Hilton Repertory Theater in St. Louis. It's now called the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. Right. 
And they had a company called the Imaginary Theater Company. It was their touring arm. And they did exclusively uh, uh, plays that in, in kind of the realm of story theater. I don't know even if people talk about that term anymore these days, st- story theater. But it's basically, it's a, it's a form of theater that is all about uh, highlighting the spoken word, uh, and the written word, um, and that 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 telling the story was is the most important thing. It's a very kind of primitive form of theater where there is a minimum of costumes, a minimum of sets, uh, virtually no lighting. You you play you you tour, and you play everything from big high school gyms to community centers to. You get dressed in the principal's office, uh, and you know you, it's 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 so basic, and it's all about. There's, you have nothing to hide behind. Uh, there are no technical elements that that necessarily can uh, can help you or cover up for deficiencies. So it's all about telling the story, getting out there in front of people with with only your talent and the words. Uh, of of the playwright or the uh, you know the the literary source, the the whole idea behind it, at least the ones we did, was all about giving. We toured. The mission was to give kids the opportunity to see how literature can come to life, and to encourage reading in schools, basically. Right. Uh, so what that really instilled in me was this whole idea of that the oh, but what's really more important besides more than my character. More than you know, uh, my character's voice or how he walks, or you know, all that stuff is is important. But it all has to serve. What is the story that mm-hmm. we're telling? For sure. And that that uh, that goes for Shakespeare. That goes for contemporary theater. That goes for everything. Is what is the story I'm telling? Um, because I use I use my body. I use my voice. All of that stuff in order to serve the story. The actor becomes really a, a vessel. Uh, it, 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 it also kind of, it kind of takes away the self-consciousness of, of acting, of, oh, people are looking at me, what am I doing now? If you are really focused in on, my whole goal is to share the story with you, uh, then you're really not terribly involved in, in how I look or how I sound. Or even how I feel. Um, it's really, am I getting the story across to people? Mm-hmm. And that's really a principle that is that has carried me all the way through my career. What would you say is the most challenging aspect of, of, of doing that, of getting into that? Is there a is there something that you regularly have to overcome or work harder than others? Well, with 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 the case of when I was doing story theater, the most challenging thing which was also the scariest and the most exciting thing was we would go into a rehearsal or rehearsal hall with no idea what we were going to (laughs) do you know we we had we thought well you know it'd be nice to do some some work by this guy or that guy but there was no script there you know somebody might come in with a short story and say but wouldn't this be great to do and we'd look at it and go yeah wow what a great story and then you have this moment of deadly silence where you say well but how do we do it how do we how do we bring it to life there are four of us we have no sets we have no costumes we got no props how do we bring this to life Mm -hmm. uh to an audience so that is the most exciting part of it because it's all on you it's all it's all about the communal effort to tell the story is that Um, is that improvisational the most exciting thing and it's also it's also the most challenging is is that improvisational or is that was there script uh, it's it's all it's all with a script. Um, yeah, I, I mean, sometimes we would find improvisational ways to. We would talk about you know finding the handle of the story. Uh, I remember one we did a, we did this uh, uh, Hans Christian Andersen story called uh, the Nightingale, and uh, you know it's it's written like a traditional children's story. And we started to find uh, uh, it almost, it, it, it seemed very formal, and we, and there was a, a real uh, 
simple kind of almost Asian way of telling the story, hmm. we, we kind of found this form uh, of this formality in movement um, and in gesture, very simplistic, very simplistic, very, very basic. Um, so we kind of found that form, but we didn't change a word of the, of the, of the script. So the, the, the words really led us to the form. Um, I remember doing that also with a, with a story by Ray, Brad, Ray Bradbury called There Will Come Soft Rains, this wonderful story about a, about a house that is um, um, so modern that uh, it, it can live by itself. <laughs> it has, it has it basically, it, it, it was very, uh, for a story that was written in the 60s, it was remarkably prescient. You know, there's all kinds of smart instruments all the way through the house. The, 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 the alarm wakes you up and tells you when, you know, uh, what time it is. The, the, uh, in the kitchen, the, the food cooks by itself at a certain time. It's a smart house, basically. And then there's a, uh, and, and, but, but then one day, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a tree falls and starts a fire and burns down the house. But all of the smart technology continues. Huh. You know, it's a really, really creepy story about the future. And, you know, we, it, it was so, um, uh, we, just, we found this kind of form of doing, we, we started thinking about those audio animatronic characters at Disneyland. Right. And how they're, how they're all kind of perfect. They all sound perfect. They move perfectly. And so we really found all this movement that was all very self-consciously perfect. And, and that informed the way we told the story. Again, we went to Bradbury's words. We didn't change a thing. Uh, but it seemed to be the handle that we found to tell the story. N- not, not that it means anything, truthfully, but uh, I've had the great good fortune to meet and chat with uh, Ray Bradbury twice. So that was, that was amazing, to, because he was, to me... Isn't he's, he a great guy? Uh, I met he, him, too. Yeah. He, I, I directed, out in California, I directed a production of uh, Dandelion Wine. Oh, is that right? And he came and saw it. I was so thrilled. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't fly. He was afraid of flying. Oh no! And he didn't drive. He had and to he be would driven. Drive everywhere. Right. He had to be driven. He didn't know how. He did not know how to drive. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And, and grew up in Los Angeles of all places. So that's kind of yeah. odd. But but there you have it. Um. All right. So you've cl- clearly you've worked for many different directors over the years. What would you say are the most important lessons you've taken away from working with your favorite directors? Oh boy, that's a God. That's a good question. Um, hmm. Sometimes I get lucky. I'd say, you know, I, I think um, <laughs> directors who 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 are truly leaders, um, who I've never I've, I'm never able to really work for a director who does not instill confidence in me. Mm-hmm. Um, Directors who understand how difficult acting is, and 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 what a challenge it is to your to your to your just sense of confidence. Right. Um, that's a big part of it. It doesn't mean a director is not hard on you, and not you know uh, um, able to you know spot where where you need to uh, adjust your work. Where it's not coming across, where you where you need to to uh, to go in a different direction to fulfill the, the director's vision. Um, so there's there's that that sense of uh, for a director of really uh, guiding you toward toward the vision that they've got. What are you looking for when you get into a rehearsal period? I am looking for no drama. You're uh, you're, doing, that, you're doing you're doing drama. Thing. You're doing you drama. Know, the, leave, the drama the drama exists in the work itself. Yeah. Uh, the drama does not exist in the working conditions. Uh, the working conditions are so important uh, that you you need to be you need to develop a really good uh, nurturing 
strong working tenor in the room where there's there's not a lot of tension. Uh, it's it's all about let's let's work this out. Let's figure out how to do this. So that's that's really I think I think it's if I can, if I can feel like we're part of a team from the very beginning, that makes a big difference. You're looking for um, uh, sort of a very common professional approach. Uh, no histrionics at all, correct? Right, right, yeah. Uh, and you know, when they come, because it's a stressful, it's a stressful thing to do, to do plays, and people will, uh, you know, have various times where your confidence leaves you. The stress is is talking, and so you have to also be, you also have to have the generosity to go. Oh yeah, okay, okay, all right. You're going through a tough day today. I get it. And you're not really taking this out on me. Uh, you're not. You're. You're just. You're kind of floundering. You don't know what to do, and that's okay. You know. So it's. 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 That's where the. That's where the generosity, the ability. You know, you got to fail in rehearsal. People fail all the time in rehearsal, and it's not the end of the world. It's. It's. Uh, it's all about working, trying things out. Some and things don't work, and when they don't work, you move on to something else. Well, I. Uh, so it's. A, it's. It, it's a combination. It's not like I, you know, there's a there's a balance there. You don't want to set set. You don't want to try to set up a, a world where there's absolutely no, uh, ten, no difficulty, uh, no, you know, people are are all about being generous and being supportive of each other. I mean, that's all wonderful. But there are days when that kind of feeling leaves you, and you have to, um, you all have to be aware of that, aware of fallibility. An artist. Mm-hmm. Well, you know um, that uh, that gentleman named George Bernard Shaw. He once said, <laughs> uh, "A man who makes no mistakes makes nothing at all." So, yeah. so you have to fail to succeed. Mm-hmm. I think that that's a, a valuable line that to to remember because most people don't like to fail, and nobody wants to fail. But sometimes you have to in order to get to the next level. Um, all right, so. Uh, uh, you've clearly been at this for quite some time, and in the very early days of your learning to be an actor, I assume that there were many different things that you did, exercises and so on. Do you still do anything to this day that re- regularly develops your acting chops? You know, I think the, probably the thing I do the most is just the hardest thing about acting is being in the moment. And I think what i do now is is really do everything i can to to be relaxed when i go on stage to be focused in on you know what what is it i'm trying to do what is the story i'm trying to tell uh and not think about all the other stuff uh, i i think and i think the older you get i think the better you get at that yeah i agree uh, it's, I think I think the I think the actor's biggest enemy, at least me, for me, the biggest enemy throughout my career has been anxiety mm-hmm. and and just overcoming anxiety or living living with the anxiety, saying, Okay, all right, I'm a little scared right now, that's fine. This is what I'm gonna do to distract myself so that that doesn't become the work. Um, so that's I it, it's 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 the head case part of, of acting, I think, that is probably the what I prepare for the most. Now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I try to, I mean, I stay in shape. I just, I just ran this morning. I do a lot. I, I run, I swim. Um, you know, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of, uh, I don't, I don't, I do not spend a half an hour uh, screaming my voice out and, and, and warming up with, uh, you know, tantric yoga exercises or anything, <laughs> anything really uh, uh, I'm I'm old, you know. I'm old. I don't I don't do that. Do so much of that stuff anymore. I I, I just try to I get it. I just kind of fit. I I and ready. I I get it. I, you, you, there's a there is a limit to uh, to beating yourself up in that way. Um, do you do you still get nervous before you go on stage? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it depends. I guess I guess if I'm not at all nervous. Uh, then I'm probably starting to worry. Like this doesn't really mean that much to me. Right. This is not challenging me that much. So, a, a little nerves uh, is 
is normal. Uh, it's just it's just overcoming that, you know. And and if, when you get nervous, then you then then I just I just go, okay, what am I going to do now? And what am and then what and what am I doing at this exact moment? And trust that I've been working hard enough that I know what comes next. Right. And I know what and but I, and I don't have to think about what comes next right now. All I have to think about is what am I doing now? Very very good. Um, so, so, you know, so uh, it's, it's it, particularly, I mean, I, you know, when I'm doing stuff by myself, you know, doing like solo performing, uh, that's really all you can do is you work as hard as you can. You, you rehearse well, you're prepared, and then you walk out there and, and just focus on the now. R- right. I think that's, I think that is the prime and most key thing to great performances that I've seen, and you look at all the great movie actors in particular, and they really have to get relaxed right in front of a camera. You, they can't do it yeah. any other way. They can't do it if they're all stressed out. It, it shows in the camera. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how they do it. That's kind of an alchemy to me because I've never really, I've never, uh, you know, I've never been in a film in any more than being a, 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 a you know, a walk-on or a an extra. I don't know how they do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a specific approach or a technique that you use to learn lines? Wow, the more, yeah, well, time. Time is the big thing. Uh, you know, I, I, now, if I don't, if I don't have a month, a full four weeks before I have to go into rehearsal, then I get really worried. Uh, you know, my, the brain, it just doesn't work as fast <laughs> as it used to. Um, you know, I used to when I was in my twenties and thirties. I used to laugh at at actors who would walk around backstage running their lines. You know, these these ancient forty, fifty year old actors <laughs> who would, uh, you know, they would practice. They would talk to themselves, and I go, "Man, if you don't know it by now, let's see." Well, now I understand. You you really <laughs> it is it is really difficult and a challenge to keep to keep that that kind of. I don't know if you would call it long-term or short-term memory going, but keeping it keeping it uh, working and keeping it efficient. So I need I need a good month, and I also I all I learned in my twenties. I I read somewhere that John Gielgud wrote that wrote out his lines. So I've been I write out all of my lines. Um, now it's become almost superstition. You know that uh, now I just. I just I, I, I would feel incomplete if I didn't write the write the lines out as I was learning them. Just, it also helps with uh, the way I write them out. It, it it helps to kind of look at the structure of the language. Is, um, you know, I, I I tend to kind of uh, write the write the stuff out in 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 thoughts, um, so that I kind of I start to find out where the little. Here might be a place where might be a good time place to take a breath. This is a place where there's a comma here, and so the next thing I say um, is a kind of a new thought. So it might be good to vary something vocally there. Uh, so you know, I learn a lot about the the rhetoric of language by writing this stuff out too. Do you write it just once or multiple times? Yeah, just once. Just once. Um, just once. I got all these notebooks full of you know. I, I usually after about. After a, once we get into rehearsal, once we get into performance, I take the notebook and I usually throw it away because mm. I stop looking at that. I'm, when I'm when I'm running over lines before a play, I'm looking at the script, not necessarily at, at the at the stuff that I wrote out. All right, so because the stuff I wrote out, you know, the the the, the, the script has the cues. The stri- the script just has uh, there's just more there to 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 work on. Right. So the, once I write out the lines the one time, and then once I learn them, that that written thing becomes kind of superfluous, and so, I throw it away. All right, so once you've opened a show, you're talking about now that once you've gotten to that point or deep into it, you, you get rid of that particular uh, technique of yours. But once you've opened a show and you're into a run of a show, do you actively s- continue to seek new things about the character in the show? Yeah, I'd say within within a a, a a fairly tight framework. You know, I don't want to throw anybody. Right. I don't want to throw an actor by uh, 
by by tossing them something that that they don't expect. Uh, a lot of times, I will just uh, I will be standing, getting ready to go on, and I'll say, "All right, what am I going to work on today?" You know, what am what? And that can be that can be very technical. It can be now, make sure that I'm that I'm breathing right, right, breathing properly, breathing uh, and that there's that there's there's nowhere I'm really pushing anything vocally, or I might think of you know go back to some of those things the 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 the, the buttons the emotional buttons that this work pushes in you, um, you know the the uh, when I first you know the, uh, when I first started work on it what made me excited about this, doing this role in that what did it touch in me what did it what did it force me to to use for my own life in order to make this work, make this, make this work, um, uh, more vital to me. So sometimes I will just kind of freshen up that stuff. Mm -hmm. Other times I'll come out and go, all right, just make sure that your images, you know, one guy said to me years ago, uh, when an actor acts, he sees a picture, he sees a movie, um, running across his forehead. There's a, there's a movie there. So make sure that that movie that you see, that imagery you have, is 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 bright and and uh, vital that you haven't let it kind of go stale. Mm. Other times I'll go out there and say, just focus completely on the other character, the other person. Look in their eyes. Take as much as you can from from uh, what somebody is giving you, and see where it takes you. I, I love so that. There's, I... there's always something different to to work on. Yeah, when you uh, when you do the work, and that 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 keeps it fresh. I, I I love the movie imagery. That's that's a really cool thought. Um, you know, because that that way you're 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 visualizing what you're doing. I think that's really great. So, do you ever have? Yeah. Do you ever? And it helps you with memorization too. Sure, that makes sense. You're starting to associate things visually in your head with lines and so on. I think that would help. Um, do right. you? Do you have any um, tricks for not becoming complacent, or have you ever become complacent in a run? I don't think I ever have. I think somewhere along the line, uh, you know, there might have been a director somewhere in the past who said complacency is your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, in in stage work, I mean, I've never done I've never done a a, a hugely long run. I, the most performances I've ever done of any one play is made probably. 50 or 60. So I don't really get involved where I'm, you know, on a national tour and doing the same role for three years. Right. It's never happened. Right. Um, it would be interesting. I'd, I'd be interested to see what that would be like. Sure. But it's never been in the cards for me. So, uh, so I don't really have that many, that many performances. It's, a, it's, it's pretty hard to get complacent uh, for me. I don't, I don't get anywhere near comfortable in a role until I've, Put in at least fifteen performances, right? And then I start thinking, okay, I think I got, I think I got this. Now I can build on it. I'm R not, right. I'm not just so scared I'm going to screw something up. Uh, I can, I can move forward. Well, speaking of, of screwing up, have you? Can you think of a, a like a disaster that's happened on stage? Something really screwed up, and how you recovered from it? Oh yeah. Well, I can think of two. Uh, one is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, when something goes wrong and you have to improvise. Yeah. And then there was another story about when something goes wrong at an amazing time in in the script uh, that becomes incredibly ironic. There was I did this production uh, of the comedy of errors. Yeah. Outdoors in Chicago years ago, and. Uh, I was playing Antipolis of Ephesus, who is a guy who's there's a point in the play where he's trying to get into his, into his house. He's trying to he's bringing people home, uh, uh, an important client that he wants to impress, and they get to the door and they can't get in because he's been mistaken uh, for somebody else, and he can't get in, and he gets embarrassed and frustrated. He keeps banging on the door. Well, in this scene, in this production, this open air production in Chicago. For some inexplicable reason, we had these big 10-foot towers on either side of the stage, and they had casters on them. And actors could get in them and move them around 
the director had some kind of idea about that. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but, but that was it. We all hated these things because they were always stealing focus and, you know, breaking down and all this stuff. So one night we're out there, and I come in to try to get in, and uh, it happens to be one of those nights in Chicago where the, the wind comes off Lake Michigan, and all of a sudden it's like there are 25-mile-an-hour winds up on stage. I can see this guy next to me. His hair is blowing all over the place. <laughs> and we get to this scene, and the wind just keeps kicking up and kicking up and kicking up. And finally, I look over on the right, and one of these big 10-foot towers starts to move. <laughs> and it, it gets picked up by the wind and rolls downstage. Oh. Fortunately, there was a moat between the stage and the audience for safety's sake, yeah. and this big tower teeters and falls over to the front and, and crashes right in the, the, in the moat. Top of the whole top of the thing falls off. Wow. So, I mean, we're sitting there stunned, and, and then in a couple of more seconds, the wind take picks up again, and this other one, this other one on the other side of the stage, <laughs> starts to roll and roll, and crashes off stage. <laughs> There's this point, this silence in the audience. They're going, what, what are they going to do? And I had the next line a at the door, and I swear to God, my next line was, there is something in the wind that we cannot get in. <laughs> and the, the audience went nuts. It was like the biggest laugh I ever got in the play. <laughs> so that was, a, that, was, that was a great one that went wrong. Do, do you have any other oddball or weird or quirky stories well, okay, that you could yeah, share? Oh, yeah, I got the other, the other one. The other one takes place uh, in this production of The Three Musketeers, where I played Alexandre Dumas, the author. Yeah. And uh, this play was took place, uh, the, the set design was uh, used a turntable. And, you know, most actors, when you get to the first day of rehearsal and you hear there's going to be a turntable, everybody kind of, their hearts kind of sink. You go, <laughs> man... Things can just go wrong. Turntables just always go wrong. Something happens. And uh, the whole premise of this thing was that, uh, so Dumas, the guy, character I'm playing, he's on the stage. He's on the front of the turntable at the beginning of the play, and he's writing, 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 writing. And he's doing this episodic thing, and there's always, there's always pressure on him to keep coming up with new episodes of The Three Musketeers, you know. So the first scene, the one of the uh, business guys, the three-piece suits, comes comes to him and says, "You're going too slow. You gotta you gotta pick up this story. You gotta come up with something new." And so the the conceit of the play is that he comes up with these ideas, and then as he uh, as he starts to work, the turntable turns around, and this, there's the scene. And so the very first scene, what's supposed to happen is that the guy comes up, gets in my face, and says, "You gotta work harder." I take a glass, a sip of wine, pick up the quill, and I start writing, which is the cue for the turntable to start moving, revealing what's happening, what's about to come. So the scene happens. I pick up the, 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 the quill. I take, I take a sip of wine. The cue comes, and nothing happens. I'm sitting out there. Turntable is not moving, not moving, not moving. Then it starts up, and then it stops, and then it starts up, and then it stops. And then it lurches violently, and <laughs> the wine that I got at the desk falls into my lap, and then the <laughs> thing stops completely dead. And again, there's this dead silence. And I look to the audience, and I did not, this, instead of, I, this I came up with the best ad lib I think of my life, which was, um, ladies and gentlemen, that is what is known as writer's block. <laughs> <laughs> audience went nuts biggest laugh of the night biggest laugh of the whole run of this play actually <laughs> so that that that, that is very proud of that that is a good exemplar of writer's block <laughs> yeah yeah so all right so it, over time my assumption is you've had people give you good pieces of advice what would be something that somebody has told you that was a good piece of advice and then share with us a good tip or a piece of advice for someone trying to make their bones in the business, what they should be thinking about? One of the great pieces of advice I've gotten about acting and about being in plays and about the whole, ang 
the, the the hard work of creating is, you know, it's not just all about you. If you just take your take the pressure off yourself and say, you know, it's not about me. How am I coming off? How am I looking? What are people going to say about me? Uh, how do I feel? If you just take yourself out of that and know, realize that people go to see plays, they read plays, they write plays, they create, uh, it's, it's not just about your experience. Um, you know, it, and, and I think that also, that kind of comes back to the story theater work that I did, which was, you know, you're, it's really about what is the story you're telling and what do you want to share with people. Mm-hmm. And you, you play a part in that. Um, not a role in, you know, not a, not a written part in that, but I mean, you are, you are, you are part of that effort. Um, even, even if you're up by yourself on stage, it's not just you. There are lots of other people who are helping you get there. Um, so that's probably the, the best piece of advice I've gotten is just to, just to know that it's just not about you. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as, you know, people starting in this business, you know, the business is very different than it was when I started. And, you know, what I'm learning more in the last 10 years, and I've got, and, and I've got a daughter who is, who is starting in this career. She's, she's in her mid-20s. She's gotten the, you know, the university degree and the MFA program, and she's got her equity card and everything. But, and, but it's a different world that she is walking into mm-hmm. than, than mine was. For sure. The, the, one of the things that she learned most in grad school, which I'm eternally grateful for, is the idea of, of creating your own work. You know, of really using yourself to make opportunities for yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, I think, is, is probably the most practical advice for young people going into this career. You're not going to be taken care of by a theater. Uh, you you have to you have to create your own work and you have to be willing to work outside the box of traditional regional theater um, to come up with your own ideas and become your own entrepreneur that's the that's the biggest thing that's a that's a big thing and and to to that end huge, i mean we'll, we'll, let's talk about for just 2 seconds before uh before we uh call a halt to this whole thing but uh um you have written a number of shows that were that you were in, and uh, including one of late uh, based on the life of Carl Sandburg, right? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And that's a one man show. It is a one man show. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it is basically uh, my opportunity to to share the work of a guy that I think is just a brilliant writer mm-hmm. who has kind of been forgotten. Um, I agree. By this, by our, by our culture, by our society. And I'm trying to get him back, uh, into the, into the public view because I think he's just such a fascinating character. Mm-hmm. Well, for- he's, uh, he's, he is, he, he, he is a guy who, basically worked across the aisle all the way through his career he was he was a real social activist but he was also a lover of america he was loved and admired by people of all kinds of political persuasions in this country Mm -hmm. and in a in a time now where we live with such partisanship and such tribalism and such nationalism where where if you're either on one side or the other this is a guy who did not who defied that his whole life and I think give, he gives me hope every day that that still exists in our world, that there is a way to, to really touch people of different political ideas. There are things that we all hold dear, and, and that's why I really want to bring, uh, bring him to people, because he's a perfect example of a, of a guy who did that. Well, and he did it mainly through poetry and song, not through diatribes, right? Right, yeah, and and yeah, we... yeah, he he did. He was an amazingly uh, versatile. He wrote. I mean, he he won the Pulitzer Prize for his poetry, but he was also his historian. Uh, he was a newspaper man. He was a folk music archivist. 
Uh, he influenced people like Pete Seeger uh, with the, the 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 folk music that he dug up, the you know from America's history from the Revolutionary times on. I mean, he was an amazingly eclectic uh, r- literary figure. Well, you know, it's we don't have figures like that in our world today, and maybe we need a few. Maybe you'll inspire some people out there to start to think like Carl Sandburg and to try and bring uh, um, their points of view to the world in a way that was similar to, to the way Sandberg did it, which we're missing right now. It's not in. It's not out in the zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah I think we. I think we need it desperately, and I think we're starting to figure out that we need it desperately. I. I and agree. here's a voice saying, "Well, here I am. I got something." I agree. Well, I. I think that anybody that uh, happens to see, um, what's the title of the sh- the show? At, at, at the moment, it. it seems to change from time to time, but right now it's an evening of Carl Sandburg. An evening of Carl Sandburg. So if you happen to see an evening of Carl Sandburg in your local repertoire of theater, make a point to see it, especially with uh, Jonathan Gillard Daly. John, it, this has been a great treat for me to have you on Storybeat today. I'm so happy you spent a little time here, and, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you sometime in the near future. Well, me too. We will catch up again i got to get out to Pittsburgh again. Yeah, for sure. Or you got to come to Wisconsin. Well, we'll figure it out. Or maybe a little of both. <laughs> a little of both, yep. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Steve. It's great talking to you. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.